morning everyone um, i on behalf of cta would like to thank uh, honorable vice, vice chancellor for coming here to this program and geshe uh, tupdin jimbala for being here and all the participants today and uh, i would like to mention that our director uh, gave his apology for missing today's program because he had to uh, be with the uh, department of education uh, with, uh, with the Department of Education and George, so uh, he gave his apology. Uh, since we are very uh, short on time, uh, can I please uh, call upon uh, Geshe Tupdi Jimbala for, uh, to give a small address to the gathering. Uh, actually, Sophie, if you sit here, I need to use the... Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to know that uh, you know my wife, Sophie, and... Uh, her colleague Tara has been able to offer some workshop here. Uh, Sophie has been here now almost uh, two weeks, and Tara has been here for about a week. Um, and, um, and I would like to thank uh, Professor Ngao Samdenla, Vice Chancellor, for you know, really inviting them and giving them this opportunity, as well as giving you the opportunity to be exposed to this very important um, new initiative that is such an important part of, uh, you know, modern development in the education in the West. Um, and Sophie and Tara have already spoken with you the historical background, the origins of a social em emotional movement, and the scientific that is evidence that is increasingly you know, backing it up. And how um, it's been around for over two decades now, and it's particularly strong in the Western countries. Uh, it was started in the US and then in Canada as well as, and then in Europe in many parts of the Western world, it's really w well established. Um, and today, uh, in most of the schools in the West, um, you know, they would expect there to be some form of, depending upon how advanced or detailed, they would expect some form of social emotional program as part of the school curriculum. Uh, how they will integrate it into that particular school system would vary from school to school. In some um, schools, they will actually incorporate it as part of uh, physical education or uh, health or well-being. And in some schools, they probably will find a way to integrate it as part of the everyday curriculum, which is in fact you know, what Sophie and Tara would like to see, so that all the teachers and all the members in the school, um, particularly the adults, uh, are you know, aware of this particular way of doing things and be exposed and cultured in this language. So I just wanted to give you the background. I'm sure they have done a fantastic job. But uh, one thing that, um, um, you know, and it became very clear from their experience of uh, leading the workshop um, is how when you move into a new cultural environment, how the the underlying concepts behind the social emotional learning may fit into the existing worldview of that particular culture. In the case of uh, Tibetan Buddhist culture, um, you know, most people will immediately think in terms of now how does that relate to Buddhist psychology? You know, what about Lojong teachings? What about Lamrim teachings? So, um, in an ideal world, um, you know, when you are doing workshop, it's actually better to leave these questions aside and bracket them. But not all of us are capable of doing it. You know, I mean, there is something to be said for this idea of a Zen mind, beginner's mind. And when you are learning a new topic, it's as much as possible if you can approach it with a beginner's mind. There's a kind of a freshness because you allow yourself to be much more kind of, you know, um, ability to move into that world without resistance. But a lot of us are not capable of doing it because we are all conditioned, we have our own worldviews, we have our own language, we have our own values and you know fixed ideas and so on. So we're all human beings you know, and older you are, you're more fixed in your way of thinking because it's an accumulation of the experience of having been a human being, having lived in a society and so on. Uh, but Generally, uh, it is much more helpful. And for those who are trained in the monastic system, this is something we do. For example, when we study you know, Abhidhamma, we study Abhidhamma as if we believe in the philosophy of Abhidhamma. 
which is completely contrary to the Madhyamaka philosophy that the monks have been exposed literally a few years before. So that now they're completely switching it around and pretending that they are Abhidhamika, Abhidhamikas. And this is how the monastic scholarship is so effective because the monks learn to completely approach a new topic with an open mind. Now, on the other hand, yes, still the work has to be done to how to um, make a connection between what you already have and what is being brought in. And where things are going to be most effective is when that kind of integration is achieved. Okay, so my job here is to try to help you do that. <laughs> okay, um, so what I will do is I will speak for maybe uh, 20 minutes and then I'll open it up for another 20 minutes for question and answers so that you can ask me questions. And if you prefer asking in Tibetan, ask in Tibetan. If you prefer asking in English, ask in English. Right? But I assume that all of you, uh, you have a good command of English, so I'm going to actually speak in English. Is that uh, okay? Yeah, everybody's okay. Yeah. So um, one of the things that was uh, uh, that's very important for Sophie's and Tara's uh, curriculum or approach is, uh, I mean, if you can, if you can, if you ask, what is that one thing that holds everybody, everything together in their approach? Okay. It's really what they call emotional literacy. And the emotional literacy is an idea that you teach children, students, and ideally the adults themselves should have some mastery of it, um, how to first of all recognize and catch or be aware whether you are being emotional. Because often people get emotions are very swift. When they arise, you lose your control. Okay, So it is important to learn, to get, allow, let the children know some skills that would make them aware that they are being emotional. So that's, that's one thing is the awareness of emotion. It's not specific of what type of emotion, whether you are excited, agitated, irritated, angry, so on, or whether you are feeling disinterested. That's the emotional awareness level. Once you have that as the basis, then depending upon the age of the child, they learn to be more specific of what exact emotions they're experiencing. Because you could be disturbed by being angry, being jealous, you know, being annoyed, being excited. So, you know, you feeling restless could be caused by so many different, you know, emotions. So learning to be more specific about these emotions. And then, of course, depending upon the age, when the children are very small, before they are learning how to read, you know, they, are, they all have basic emotions, so you teach them simply the basic emotions by showing images and facial expressions. And as they get older, then they learn by reading, and then you're able to name more emotions, and so on. So the more specific you are about the emotions, the more you are able to deal with them. Because sometimes you get worked up and you don't know what you're feeling. So that's one thing. Then the other thing that is part of the emotional literacy is then making connection. Why is the child feeling that way? So if they are feeling very angry, why is the child feeling that way? Because people don't get angry for no reason. Okay? And so here, in their approach, which is drawn from the nonviolent communication kind of principles, is to make connection between emotions and needs. So needs are universal, just like emotions are universal. We all have emotions. Um, you know, the basic emotions are very universal. I mean, the higher order emotions, some of them may have cultural overlays, but basic emotions is universal. Similarly, the basic needs, like needs for safety, needs for joy, needs for friendship, needs for inclusion, need to be respected, need to be heard, all of these are universal. It doesn't really matter what culture you come from. And when these needs are not met, or especially when these needs are violated, then you react. And emotions is a signal. You know, I mean, from the evolutionary scientific point of view, emotions are very powerful. And when they arise, it is giving you a signal saying, pay attention, something important is happening to you. 
deal with it. So that's why emotions are very powerful. When you get angry, you do something because emo anger's role is to make you aware of the challenge and the danger and respond to it. So, so what they are trying to do is to teach children how to make connections between the emotions they are feeling and the needs that are being violated or not met. That really is the central principle in their approach and then everything is structured around this. Am I right in saying, okay. So, I heard that you had a problem with the thermometer. So the thermometer they were using is a way of helping children become more aware, okay? And so this is not what they are using. This I'm taking from contemporary psychology, which is the basis for that thermometer imagery. Now, you will remember, here you had a volcano, and here you had an iceberg. Okay, and then here you have the green zone. You're, you're all aware of this, okay? Now, one thing that you have to understand is the idea behind this thermometer, just like thermometer, when you use a thermometer, what you're trying to do is you are trying to find out what kind of temperature you have. That's all you care. You are not interested in why you have a temperature. You're only interested in figuring out what kind of temperature do you have. Exactly this is what it is designed for, to help children where you are on this scale, okay? Now, what is helpful is to think of the volcano and iceberg in terms of energy. Is it a high energy emotion or is it a low energy emotion? Because when you feel, it's a question of strength. So high and low here refers to high arousal. When you are highly aroused, you are vigilant, you are angry, you are careful, you know. When you are, your arousal level is low, you don't feel like doing anything. Okay, you're depressed, you're sad, you know. So it's really a question of the arousal of energy level. So volcano is a high energy level and iceberg is a low energy level. So this is what they mean by high and low. High and low has to do with arousal, you know, how aroused you are. Now, positive and negative here has nothing to do with moral judgment. So in Buddhist psychology, we would say positive emotions are good, and negative emotions are bad. And negative emotions in Buddhist psychology would be like, you know, um, anger and jealousy and those which are, you know, Migiwa or, or Nyomo. But this has nothing to do with that. This negative and positive has to do with how it is felt. When you feel that emotion, do you feel good? Or when you feel that emotion, you feel not good? That's all positive. It is, it, this is known as valence in, in scientific literature. Valence is the tone and high and low is the arousal. Okay, the valence has to do with the tone of the experience. If the tone is positive, it's a positive emotion. If the tone is negative in the sense you don't like it, it is a negative emotion. This is how contemporary psychology understands it, okay? It has no, nothing to do with moral judgment. So in social emotional learning, one of the things that they really try to do is to stay away from moral judgment. Because when it comes to moral judgments, different religions will come in. Okay? And you don't want to do that. Particularly in a school setting, whatever you bring in is supposed to be very secular and universal. Secular not in the sense of against religion, but secular in the sense of universal. So you have to really stay away from any kind of notions of moral judgment. Unless you are teaching specifically morality, then it's something else. So, so here you have to understand positive and negative in terms of the valence, you know, what it feels like. For example, like when you feel sad, you don't feel good. Okay? When you feel angry, you don't feel good. When you feel jealous, you don't feel good. Okay? Whereas if you are kind, it feels good. 
you know, if you're excited, it feels good. So it's really to do with how you feel it when the emotion arises, okay? So you can have, you know, different levels of positive emotions and some of the positive emotions have low energy. For example, like feeling peaceful and calm. It's not an excited state of mind. It is a low energy, but it is calm. So positive and negative has nothing to do with high and low. Okay, just remember, it can be positive and low. It can be positive and high. Exactly. You can have negative emotions, but high energy like anger, agitation, or positive emotion that is high, like overexcited. And similarly, you can have negative that is low, like sadness. It doesn't feel good. Depression is even worse. So depending on how low the energy is, sadness may end up in depression. That is the lowest. You don't feel like doing anything at all. You don't feel motivated. You feel you know, apathetic. So this is, so when they are using the thermometer, you are not re, they are not really trying to do anything complicated. They are simply trying to use, just remember it's a thermometer. Okay, you are testing the, the, the emotion temperature of the child. So, okay, so if you are feeling overexcited, then you need to, and the ideal place, the whole idea of this technique is to find the child, help the child be there. Okay, not here, because it's more of a negative state, but really be here. So that is a kind of a peace and calm and alert. Not down here, it's if, if you are like a, uh, 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 an ascetic who has just attained nirvana, then probably that, that ascetic person may not be particularly interested in interacting with, because the whole idea is to help children become more social and you know what they call pro-social, which is someone who will engage in helping behavior, someone who will be listening to the teacher, someone who is willing to play, someone who is willing to cooperate. That's the whole idea. And that's, that's why this is the green alert zone which is in terms of energy level in the middle, but on terms of the valence, it's on the positive side. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? So this has nothing to do with all of this, nothing to do with any of that. That is a separate question. Okay, for if you're a Buddhist scholar and you are trying to see how this connects, then it's a separate question. But in the school system, you're not bringing psychology, you're bring, using psychology's insight, but using it in a, pra practi you know, a practical way. So the thermometer's role is, you know, I said, you know, the emotion literacy has two stages. One is simple awareness, and thermometer is the tool to help children gain that awareness. And when you gain the awareness, what you're looking for is to recognize whether you are here or here, and help them get here. That's all it does, okay? It, this is what you have to remember. Now the second stage is a bit more complicated. That's when you are trying to teach children enrich their vocabulary so that they become more fine-tuned to what specific emotion they're feeling and then making them connect with the underlying needs that have not been met or violated so that they understand, so that, you know, one of the ideas is that if children understand why they are feeling a specific emotion, you know, then they will calm down because they see a reason, okay? And then they also find a way to resolve it. If someone has been part of that, you know, difficulty, then through mediation, you can really work it out. Okay, so the two stages of emotional literacy is one is awareness and one is specificity. You can call it discernment, okay? So, uh, anything else I need to say? The regulation bit at the end. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, the regulation, you can have, again, a very basic level of regulation. The very basic level of regulation is to help the child calm down. If the child is here, you need to find the, something to help the child calm down to get here, okay? So, there's a basic level of regulation where you're not dealing with a specific emotion. 
you are simply dealing with the energy of the emotion that the child is feeling and you're trying to bring the energy down at this level so that the child can become calm and therefore that the, some of the regulation strategies are more practical like breathing or some physical activity because some ch ch children are very restless and they have to move around okay so you need something so whatever regulation there so th the basic regulation is just to be able to get here by using some techniques and not they're not bothered about trying to figure out what exactly is the emotion they're feeling now the second level of regulation is a bit more complicated this is where resolutions or conflicts and so on come and that regulation will only come when you have taught the second level of emotional literacy which is this being able to name the emotions and connect them with the needs then when children are feeling very you know angry and then the teacher can bring them and say you know first of all where you are they recognize this okay and then help them to get here and then help them to go to the second level which is to connect that emotion with a need that was violated and then children will not only calm down but they, they actually resolve it okay the first regulation is just a temporary solution it's like a child is crying 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 you're just giving a candy that's it basically <laughs> to, to calm the child down but the child has not solved the problem yet now to solve the problem you have to go to the second level of regulation where the the teacher needs to help what specific emotion the child was feeling and why was that child feeling and what was the need that was violated and then once the child is able to make the connection between the emotion and the need and then child will resolve it and if it involves some other child like a fight then you bring both child together so that they can sort it out you know because nobody wants to fight just for the sake of fighting you know they fight because something has gone wrong in their relationship and if the child knows exactly why i acted in this way in a particular way why i felt this way in a particular way they resolve it because in the end everybody's the same so uh, so that is the second level of regulation so so that's why you know one of the most powerful aspects of sovintara's approach is you know they emphasize this first level of awareness emotional literacy and regulation so that it establishes a very strong foundation for not only dealing with your own individual problems the child but also becoming more empathetic because if you know that you have these emotions when you have emotions you act in a particular way and then these reasons are because there are needs that have not been met or violated once you're able to know that in relation to yourself it's another simply another step to switch it around and say this child also my friend also is the same that's how empathy kicks in and once you have empathy then the children who have who are in a conflict they recognize each other's situation and then it resolves the problem and they're also much more likely to cooperate and collaborate and so on so so this first kind of you know the me domain is really the most important part which builds the foundation for all the other work that comes after so any more uh, thing Tara you I just wanted to clarify when it's a conflict and you're at the same level then you can bring the kids together to have a discussion when you've got a clear sense of feelings and needs and they can empathize and hear each other and validate but if it's a power over conflict we talked about like a bullying situation you wouldn't put those two kids together you need to deal with that separately and make sure that we have a clear sense of the relationship it could create more of a problem if you put them together right away just wanted to clarify that Anything else I need to grab? Maybe we can have some oh. question and answers. We were too. Uh, so I, I have another 10 minutes, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Keshila. So I think uh, we shouldn't invest any time. And we should take, I was waiting this opportunity for many days. Uh, Keshila, um, I know you from a long time. But I'm a great friend of you. Mm -hmm. I had been, uh, uh, 
seen translating His Holiness and your talks and very much impressed by that. And first of all, before I say anything, I would like to, I mean, this is very much related to the mathematics and science, you know, X axis and Y axis, we have got both negatives and positives. Now it will, f it got fixed in my mind and it will remain for a very long time. Uh, so Geshila, uh, I don't have any question, but I have a few humble requests. And so whenever you get an opportunity to talk to the, especially the students, teachers, and if you could say these few things to them, it, I feel that it's quite fruitful because I had been working in DCB Suja for the last 22 years. And for me, teaching is not a job, it's a passion, and I really enjoying it. And the, the problems that we are facing is, uh, maybe it's, it's my view, but <laughs> I as a teacher and my, many of my colleagues feel like that. We are facing some problems, like uh, uh, we see uh, lacking in seeing the importance of study by the students. That is what we have seen. And uh, students, unless and until they see importance or greed in their, their, what they are doing, so they can't do well. This is one problem. And then one thing is that our Tibetans, especially Tibetan students, they are lacking in doing work by themselves. So they try to get things easily, like copying and just studying uh, when the exam is near or like that. This is one, another problem. And then we are also looking in recapitulations of whatever we learned. We don't see much problem in attention in the classroom, but uh, a mere, you know, listening for the one time is not enough for them. They have to, you know, be with the study for all the time. But in reality, we don't see such things. And then there are f a few <coughs> uh, obstructions that we witness in our schools. One is the misuse of new gadgets, and including the clothing. Uh, of course, these are important part of our life, but students are paying too much attention in all these things, and then do, they don't see importance in the, the important other things like that. And then, uh, of course, the percentage is very low, but it's quite a uh, serious problem alcohol and drug abuse, I, I should say that it's substance abuse. It's not only seen in the s schools, but we have seen this in our younger generations. And so I think these are some of the problems that I've seen <laughs> in our schools and in this. So I think I shouldn't say much. I have got a lot of things to ask if, the guess, if I, I could spend one whole day with <laughs> my questions, you know, keep on. and. Uh, one thing I would like to admit is that, so now these days, of course, the His Holiness doesn't need too much translation. So whenever you need translation, I think, of course, it's subjective. For me, Geshe-la and geshe those translation is the most simplest thing and, you know, a, a very, very nice one. Thank you so much, geshe <laughs> Um, thank you, Kenla, for sharing these uh, concerns. I, I think it's, um, um, when it comes to the gadget use and devices, I think it's a universal problem. Um, it's the problem that uh, all the societies face and nobody seems to have actual answer at this point because we don't quite know what all of this means. Um, but on the specifics of lacking motivation and um, not seeing the importance and leaving it to the last minute and and particularly not internalizing the knowledge so that you just copy. Those are very challenging, uh, particularly the, the thing about not appreciating the importance of doing the work so that, you know, I mean, I just gave a talk to, met with the, the Tibetan college students kind of meeting there and I told them that um, one thing that we Tibetans have to struggle and be conscious of is the importance of doing your own work yourself. Because there is sometimes the belief there is only one right answer to the question and you find the right answer and you just memorize it and then you regurgitate it at exam. That is a horrible way of studying because you only mem you, when you memorize, the words that you memorize don't belong to you. 
and it only stay at the level of words. And when you are asked questions, you have no, nothing to say because you haven't internalized it. So even though it may be the same thing, but you copy it and then you internalize it and you rewrite it in your own language. And anything that is rewritten in your own language, then you have a confidence because it's your words. And that way of internalizing is very important. And I just wish the teachers like yourself will be able to demonstrate this. You know, if, if children see this in action, then they will take it seriously. But if children don't see this in action, and when people memorize answers, and they get good grades, they think that is the way to do it. You know, teachers are looking for the correct answer, and the correct answers you can copy from someone who has done it, and you memorize it, and you report it back, and then they get rewarded, and that, that's partly the problem of the system. So we need to somehow, and in the West, they take care of it by making children write stories about themselves. You know, or what did you do, do during the last weekend? What did you do during the Christmas vacation? So those stories are your stories and you can't copy from someone. You know, whatever you tell, you have to tell it in your own words. And those are very skillful, very clever techniques that forces the child to articulate, you know, what she or he felt. And in our system, we don't do it. And that's part of the problem. And part, partly it has to do with culture because we Tibetans are not very good at making I statements. I did this, I did that. People think like, oh, he's just thinking about himself. You know, he's selfish. So I remember when His Holiness's autobiography, Freedom in Exile, was first came out. Um, I assisted in the part of the writing. I had few Tibetans say, this is definitely not written by His Holiness because there are so many I statements, you know. <laughs> Because in Tibetan, you can write a whole couple paragraph without using a single pronoun, you know, you can, about yourself, you know. So, when someone asks you, where are you going, you don't say, nga tolan dugi, you just say tolan dugi, you don't need the pronoun, you know. So, um, so, I think that's partly, there's a kind of a reticence, we don't want to talk about ourselves, but that's part of the problem. But I think the larger problem is, the system doesn't reward, you know, children, putting answers in their own words. Because when you put answers in your own words, your English may not be the best. But so you are rewarding people for their structure of the English rather than to the content of what the child is saying. And those are systematic, systemic issues. And unless the whole system changes, children are continually going to do this because what they want is a good grade. And if they are going to get good grade by memorizing, that's what they're going to do. So that's my opinion. Thank you. I think uh, just to add two words, uh, this is a major kind of uh, you know, problem that we face. So I th often suggest that we need to bring a very fundamental change in the whole system of the education, you know, as Gishto uh, Dunjimbala said, and the challenges that you face. And this is a very universal kind of, you know, challenge in Tibetan community uh, in, in a big way. So I think we must, uh, and also it is not just with the Tibetan, it is in India as a whole. The examinations uh, systems are not challenging and uh, the education system itself does not make uh, students, uh, you know, they do not demand much as you know that they, uh, they demand uh, uh, scoring and the scoring can be done through memorization or by any other means. The best way is to make the students to think by themselves, analytic, you know, creative, innovative. This is what in the West uh, they have, you know, if the, the students are to write assignment, they are given uh, assignments uh, almost every week. And in the universities and the colleges, they have to write uh, six, seven, you know, assignments in one subject. And they have to be very creative, innovative, and then analytic and reflective. So that is why we have to be very careful in bringing change in the whole system so that uh, we can bring change in the attitude of the students and behavior of the students. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gakishala, for taking out your time. 
Uh, I have just one question. Uh, my question is that uh, I think uh, teachers, we are uh, most of you are either, either a pre-teacher or in-service teacher. So my question is like teacher. I think in the part in the in this week there have been lots of talking about the emotions that plays a wider role, and I think uh, the role of teacher is very important for me. I was thinking yesterday, and I have been bombarded with lots of caution. So. I think it's either make a, a student's life or it either breaks a, a student's uh, career. So in my, uh, what, what I want to request you is what, kind of a, oh, what kind of a relation is uh, needed between a teacher and a student? So that uh, I think if you look at a situation, mostly they tend to see from one point of view. Either they see from a teacher's point of view or a student or either a student they see from a student's point of view. So I would request what kind of relations that have to be built? Um, well, thank you for the question. I think it's an important one. But honestly, um, I don't really have much experience teaching um, school level um, students. You know, my, whatever teaching experience I have has to do with either monastic uh, environment or university level education. So I don't really I cannot speak from my own personal experience. I mean, Sophie and Tara are the experts here. There's a reason why they have been invited to Minor Life Conference to specifically present their work and not me. Um, so I think they're probably better, you know, they're going to address this after Kishila and I leave. You have another two hours or something. So you'll oh, be able no, to talk. We, we, we have a, uh, one hour only. Oh, yeah, OK. So you will be able to address this. But um, yeah. I think the. In 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 the, uh, I mean, uh, in that that's my own, you know, kind of uh, opinion. I don't have anything to back it up. So no experience or data, but I would expect that a good and healthy relationship between a teacher and a student is that first of all, there is a respect on both sides, not just from the teachers, because in the East, we expect students to respect us. We don't expect us to respect them. So that's a sort of a, uh, there's an asymmetry in the power relation, uh, in the relationship of respect. Now clearly, there is going to be a power relationship that is asymmetric because teachers are in the powerful power position and students are in less powerful position. And that is a fact. But you would want that fact to be completely, teacher to be completely aware of this so that teacher does not abuse that situation. So teacher needs, and that guarantee for that is if the teacher is able to respect each of the child individually, because not all children are the same, and some children may be actually difficult, but that problem of difficulty of the child should not be at the expense of the teacher losing sight of this child too need, must be respected. And that is a difficult challenge because in a class setting, you have to get things done. If some child is being difficult, you get annoyed. You're also a human being and you need to just move on and the child is being disruptive. So in all of these, you know, the best scenario is for the teacher themselves to use this on yourself first so that your emotional state does not come in the way of your, your effectiveness in teaching. Because if you are able to maintain your cool and calm, then you are able to bring all the values that you have as a teacher into the actual classroom setting so that when some problems arise, you are able to handle that with a composure and calmness and without losing kindness and respect for the child. Am I... Um, <laughs> okay, you want to say? Yeah, totally. Uh, exactly what we've been talking about all weekend. Remember the connect before correct sentence? So when we can't connect at the human level, I mean, com compassionate and, and, and loving and kind level with our students and respectful, that's because we're disconnected from ourselves. And we have to do a really quick temperature check and connect our own feelings and needs. So often I'm in the middle of a situation where I'm, I know I'm losing control of this class and oh my goodness, inside of myself, I'm going crazy and I'm about to you know, yell or shout. And very quickly I have to take my temperature, say, oh my goodness, I need, mm, what do I need? I'm, I'm angry, I'm worried, I need calm, calm. So then I'll address this right now. Okay, everybody, this is not working. Let's take the temperature of the class. We're all in a volcano, including myself. 
let's get back to Calm Alert first, and then we're going to discuss this. So, so the, the, this is a kind of relationship, the connection be, before the correction, if you have to address a behavior based on this respect, is what also we call positive discipline. And it's all based on cell. So I'm the model, I do it for me, for myself first, and, and I connect at the human level. Really, uh, a five-year-old, a three-year-old in front of me is a full human being in its full capacity, no matter how old they are. And I think this is the kind of relationship we have to aim for. And that doesn't mean I'm going to let them do whatever. <laughs> but for me, they're all human beings. And then I'm going to also connect to myself and then see how I can address and correct after. So. See, now you can see, she can say things in a much more practical way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and there are tools that you can give. Yeah. No, but you, you explained it beautifully. Yeah. Any question? Uh, sure. Uh, just now we have discussed about uh, the compassion, right? Uh, connect before correct. When we deal with the connect, we have to deal in a way uh, with the, having the sense of compassion towards them. But again, compassion is not something we can done overnight, right? It's yeah. it's something which uh, which we have to inherit either from the care of our parents or the care of our elders, the, the way society works, the way we deal in our day-to-day -day life. There's so many hindrances. If you even if you use so much social medias, which ultimately uh, hinders your a way of thinking towards others, when way of thinking towards your students, even if you're a married a person, you might have so many family problems. And there is a higher chances of bringing that problem into class. So before understanding the tools, methods, means, you should be more of a compassionate person from your heart. But again, how we have to build it. Well, that's a very, very big question, actually. Um, I think um, one of the things that we, um, we need to pay attention to is that we need to make a distinction between two things. One is the practical tools that we are going to bring into, our, into the classroom situation when we are teaching. So those are very practical tools, like the thermometer, okay? Like calming down when you, are, when you recognize you're losing. Um, those are very specific practical tools which are very important and Sophie and Tara have ex shown you how they structure these tools. But at the same time, as you can see, as you have seen from the SEL framework of the five components of SEL with the additional interdependence, it's also not just about the practical tools, specific tools, it's about a way of thinking. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a world view, it's an outlook, you know, which recognizes the importance of emotional awareness, which recognizes the importance of ability to self-regulate, which recognizes the importance of social awareness. So it's also a way of thinking. It changes the culture because what you're doing is SEL framework introduces a new culture, new thinking about education and the classroom management because the old traditional classroom management was a top-down power over approach where discipline is viewed in the form of a stick. And then children are afraid and you're using primarily the teacher's authority as a power figure and fear of being beaten as the deterrence to keep the class together. That's the old way of thinking. Once you disallow physical punishment, corporeal punishment, which is what has happened now in many Tibetan schools, at least in the Tibetan TCV network, then how do you ensure the discipline, okay? Is it going to be chaos? Of course not. But that, to make sure it's not a chaos, has to be made possible through bringing a completely new culture of thinking about discipline, in, of thinking about, you know, um, classroom discipline and classroom management. And there, so the point I'm trying to make is that you should not get fixated on the specific tools alone. The specific tools are very important, and in a workshop setting, you learn them. And the, the, in, the thing about the specific tools is that if you don't learn them by doing it, you never gain mastery. 
So this is where the experience of someone like Tara and Sophie are so valuable because they have taught it for now more than 10 years and they know which works and which does not work and which is more immediately effective, which needs to be a long-term strategy and all of this. You know, unless you have taught it, you don't have, I mean, I can theorize, I can imagine, I can, you know, speculate, but all of this is going to be purely from the, my theory. So this, when it comes to the specific tools, you really need to learn them by doing it. But you should not think that your workshop is done if you just learn the tools. That those tools need to be situated in the larger framework, which is a philosophy. I mean, this is, this is a kind of a philosophy of education. You can call it philosophy of education. There's a theory behind it which says that if you're in a green alert zone, you're going to be learn, children are going to be learning more efficiently. If they learn in the green alert zone, what they learn, they will re remember it. If children are you know, happier, if children play more, if there's more cooperation, they're going to learn more effective. This is a theory. This is a whole new theory of learning which has a lot of scientific basis. So I think, you know, um, so the compassion issue is really has to do with this larger picture, the framework. Okay, so the framework would involve the importance of social awareness, which is the basis of compassion, because social awareness simply says the world is not just about you, there are other kids. I mean, simply that's what social awareness is saying, you know. <laughs> so don't think you are the only person that matters in this room, there are other kids who are equally important. That's social awareness. And that is the basis for a healthy relationship because when you are then going to interact, you're going to be negotiating, you know. Whereas if you think I'm the most important person, then you want to do whatever, you know, you want the world to be revolving around you. So that is basically the heart of compassion. The heart of compassion demands that you take seriously the need and the well-being of the child person in front of you. And that's, this is how empathy is the basis of compassion. So I think those things, you know, being aware of these two dimensions, the specific tools, the practical tools, and then the larger framework of philosophy and psychology that supports it. And then you need to pay attention to both so that your mastery of the tools will enrich your philosophy and your master of the philosophy will also enrich the tools that you bring in a class setting. Okay? And I just would like to add, you know, when you, you, yeah, there are a few teachers here, but when you go back alone, you, you would have an impact. You could start giving out information, but bringing cell is a whole systemic approach. You need a whole school to get engaged, with, especially the principal leading the way and, and organizing the school as such. And it changes the culture, it really does, but it takes three to five years. So once you implement cell programs, you will change the culture of your school. And right now in Quebec, we, we're, we're talking about compassionate climate schools. And, and because we know it, it really has a direct impact on this. So uh, the compassion comes, but as Jimpa was you know, explaining very well, it's, it's not just about the tool, it's, this is something larger, it's a whole systemic approach. Okay, so I think we, Kishila and I need to go, so uh, we'll stop here. So, Kishila. Uh, Kishila, thank you for the edifying talk and discussion. Uh, secondly, uh, we would like to, on behalf of CTA, thank uh, our resource person, Sophia and uh, Dara, for uh, holding this workshop. And uh, please accept our small, humble appreciation. And I would like to ask the, our, our Vice Chancellor to give away the position. Yeah, yeah uh, first let me speak uh, you know, for two minutes. <laughs> um, thank you, Student Chimbala, uh, Sophie, and Tara, and to all the uh, participants. Um, uh, I won't just speak about how we got into this because we already spoke on the first day. So it is, uh, I feel very good that we have been able to, you know, organize this workshop and introduce uh, social emotional learning in our, uh, you know, the school kind of uh, society, we can say. And uh, uh, because this is very important uh, so far in modern education and in all of the schools that you have been, you have been teaching or you are going to teach are mostly 
based on modern education system where the informations and knowledges are given about the external world but not about the inner world, right? Not about yourself, not about your emotions. We start calculating how to reach Mars and then galaxies and then atoms and even single every single inch on the of this earth has already been measured and nothing is left out now but still our mind is to be measured which wherever we go we are not measured that is why we can cannot control ourselves because we could not measure we and we do not have uh, this kind of you know thermometer <laughs> through which we we can check ourselves and when we have some you know psychological problem then uh, people go to the doctors Actually, the, before going to doctor, or there's no need of going to doctors for this kind of mental kind of problems. One can correct it, or you know, one can uh, treat it by oneself through going all these uh, kind of you know uh, the studies and the, and then the practices. So, uh, as you can see, that in the external world, uh, how many chemicals are there? How many chemicals are there? 118, some say 122. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, if we calculate how many mental elements are there, no one knows that, you know, very few knows that. So therefore we need to know about ourselves because the way we, you know, behave depends on the way we perceive the world. So therefore it is extremely important to, to change our perspective. Our behavior is, uh, you know, dependent on how we react and uh, how we and that is uh, based on how we perceive the world so this kind of emotional learning and then how to you know manage our emotion while you are in the class while you're in at work while you're in, in the office and things like that are extremely important through this way we can you know change our we can make um, the world much happier Normally we expect the happiness from outside, but then in fact the happiness is within ourselves. And then if we are smart enough, then we can really, uh, you know, be smart by being able to, you know, create happiness for ourselves and for others as well. So therefore by going through these kind of trainings, I think now the teachers must be very, you know, uh, aware of this not only just to simply aware of this, but also should to get some training of, you know, getting to the positive side. Mm -hmm. And if you are towards the positive side, then you can lead the students, children, towards more, you know, to the, towards the positive side, uh, depending on the degree that you can, you know, you can manage. But um, as I always used to say that, uh, if you have a 10 kind of, you know, Say, for example, out of 100, if you have 10% kind of, you know, practice of these kind of regulations, then you can uh, uh, teach others to reach up to at least this five, six levels or six percentage. And uh, if you do not have, if your level of, you know, practice is very low, then you won't be able to, you know, uh, teach others and train others because you do not have uh, the experience to lead others to teach others, particularly not about the theory of uh, the world, but to teach about mental emotions, you would really need to know how to go through that and how to reach to that experience, right? So the emotional kind of world is very much related to our inner world and uh, uh, that depends on our experience, how we practice on daily basis and how we regulate on daily basis. The regulation is not simply to some extent, the more you can regulate, then you can better, you know, reach higher and higher. At some point of time, then we can think about even not having, you know, uh, anger, you know, most of the time. So we can reach to that extent. So therefore, I think uh, this uh, time, I'm, first of all, I would like to thank Gishtov uh, Dinchimbala for accepting that, you know, Sophie, so I suggested, as I told you yesterday, that I suggested uh, when I came to know that Sophie and uh, uh, were teaching in Ladakh, then why shouldn't we bring them in Tibetan uh, schools? And then, uh, you know, 
I suggested that uh, we can bring her here and then open the door. So yesterday evening I was having a discussion with uh, our uh, Shri Kalun and then suggested him that uh, these kind of things would be very beneficial for our schools. And also I would like to ask uh, the teachers who have come from different uh, schools to, you know, report to their report and ask and request to their authorities, the school administration, to write to the Dharamsala Shri Lefung uh, Education Department to organize these kind of you know, uh, workshops in, in future. Actually, we need this uh, in all of the schools and all of the teachers should get this kind of training so that this can be passed on to all of the children, right? So I really thank uh, Sophie and uh, Tara for coming and uh, you know sparing um, whole two weeks and then of course for the for coming and sharing your you know wisdom um, with the participants uh, on reflecting on the emotion thermometer so and uh, now i would like to um, uh, give a token of our thanks to sophie and uh, tara uh, for being with us uh, for this uh, whole two weeks. Oh, <laughs> First of all, to Kishit of Thank you. I haven't done anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I thank all of the participants and uh, the school teachers from different various uh, schools. I think from three schools, right? Three schools? Or more. I, I think we have uh, five from five, or six. five schools. Five yeah, Tibetan. And one. Oh, I see. So three organizations, yeah. you can say, right? Yeah. So thank you all of you for coming here, and I hope that uh, you can take it away uh, to your, uh, you know, respective schools and uh, uh, make some difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, 10 minutes tea break outside. And after that, uh, the resource person will carry on. Yeah. So we'll give you just the two minutes to fill out the, the evaluation, which will help us. And we're going to share it with Geshe-la. Um, don't put your name, no name, just how you, what you think. Um, and the maple candy. Maple comes, is, okay. So we have maple trees in Canada all over, and that's the shape of the maple leaf. And maple syrup is made from the water, the sap that comes from the tree, and it's boiled and boiled and boiled and boiled and boiled and boiled and boiled, and boiled until you just have the sugar, which makes the, we can do a syrup. We make pancakes and have it in the morning, which is my daughter's favorite, and it makes uh, candy. So we thought you would be interested in trying something that's a sweet treat from Canada. Yes. Uh, um, We'll give you two minutes to do the evaluation, then we'll tell you what's next, and we're going to let you go early. Are there any other evaluation forms left over somewhere? I don't think we have another one. Did anyone not start yet? <laughs> Did anyone have a blank one that didn't start yet that we could borrow? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Could we... Can we stop the evaluations for one second because of a special song? Oh, someone was <laughs> 
so first of all, uh, good morning to all. And uh, during this workshop, we have got uh, people from different areas. I mean, different peoples are gathered here. And we have learned uh, uh, many things from Sophie and uh, Tara. And now I'm quite confident that when I go to my school, I'll be able to share my, you know, uh, all these things to my colleagues. Okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, Sir uh, Vishnu has requested him to sing. O sing opera is okay? Uh, to perform opera, I don't know. That, but he's not very good. He says that he's not very good, but he will try his best. <coughs> Yeah, we would like to request. Otherwise, I have got. I can also help, but we have got only two mics. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 
ਸਮਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਜੀ ਜੀ ਬੰਦਾ ਇਦਾਂ ਕਿਤੇ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਦੇ ਦਿੰਦਾ ਸਮਝ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਦੇ ਦਿੰਦਾ ਹੋਊਗਾ ਪੰਗਾ ਤੋਂ ਰੁਕੇ ਜੇ ਮੈਂ ਤਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਤੁਰੇ ਜਾਂ Vishnu sir we know that you are great friend of Lucky Ali so why not you check this opportunity <laughs> His songs are pretty difficult to perform for me uh, what i just wanted to say is that the flavor that he brought uh, you are used to it but when i go to a mountain it's very still there it's like very quiet very still and then that stillness is there in that instrument that you use that's the bass and then he slowly raises the tempo and then he's he's within the stillness he's able to you know bring in speed tempo and 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 the racing of thoughts that happens at the height so it's brilliant it just recreates the for me the the experience of being on a mountain i loved it i don't want to spoil that taste for some time because our songs are a little different they're from the plains they they bring in all the drums and everything <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's some people that need to leave, so let's finish the evaluations and we're just going to wrap up and those who need to leave can leave and those that want to pick up some more articles and do a circle with us. No, 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 we finished the evaluation. If you're done with the evaluation, please just put it here and if you have a USB key and you want the material, come to the front now. We're going to give it to you. No, no, after the circle? Oh, people have to leave, that's true, okay. So, finish the evaluation and then we go out, we do our last circle and then we'll, we'll give you the USB. Hmm? It's nice outside, who wants to go out? Raise your hand. Not many people. You stay in? Oh.
Um, this article is very short on brain development of adolescents, if you work with teenagers. And this article on mindset, I thought was really, really well done with Carol Dweck and one of her students. So they're over here. I'd love for you to pick them up because I was feeling really sad that we wasted paper if people don't take them and enjoy the articles. So take them and read them so that I don't have to feel sad about trees. So when you're done with the evaluation, we'll go out. After the circle, th this is a, the final thing we're going to do together, but I would like the teachers, in-service teachers and all the schools to come and get uh, this. Nima is in charge. Oh, Nima, thank you. Okay.